Chefs Without Restaurants, episode 113 with Emmanuel LaRoche. I have the chance to work for a global company. So we are in 47 countries around the world. So I can talk to my colleagues in Asia. You know, I can talk to my colleagues in Latin America or in Europe. So that's one element of the source of inspiration, um, trying to see what's happening in, in Japan, for instance, or in Korea or, um, you know, in Peru and, uh, and say, hey, maybe there's some interesting concepts and some ideas here that, uh, you know, some of um, the brand in, uh, in uh, food brands in the U.S. would be interested. So that's one way for us to look at source of inspiration. The other one are, um, as I mentioned before, like the chefs and the pastry chefs and the, the mixologists in the country. So we do a lot of tasting. So I think I probably do, I would say, close to 80 tasting a year. Uh, and when I say tasting, it's not only one tasting. It's like, um, you know, several tasting in, in, in a city. This is the Chefs Without Restaurants podcast with your host, Chris Spear. Each week, I'll be speaking with food entrepreneurs and people in the culinary industry. If you're interested in learning more about our organization dedicated to helping people build and grow their food businesses, look us up on the web at chefswithoutrestaurants.com and .org, and on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Chefs Without Restaurants. Now, enjoy the show. Welcome to the Chefs Without Restaurants podcast. I'm your host, Chris Spear. On the show, I have conversations with culinary entrepreneurs and people in the food and beverage industry who took a different route. They're caterers, research chefs, personal chefs, cookbook authors, food truckers, farmers, cottage bakers, and all sorts of culinary renegades. I myself fall into the personal chef category as I started my own personal chef business, Perfect Little Bites, 11 years ago. And while I started working in kitchens in the early 90s, I've literally never worked in a restaurant. This week, my guest is Emmanuel LaRoche. Emmanuel has more than 20 years in the food ingredient industry and is currently in charge of marketing for a company that manufactures flavors for food and beverage companies like Unilever and Nestle. In 2018, Emmanuel launched the Flavors Unknown podcast. Every other week, he speaks to the chefs, pastry chefs, and bartenders who are creating tomorrow's trends. Full disclosure, I was a guest this spring, and you can hear me on episode 65. Emmanuel has a master's degree in organic chemistry, and an internship for his MBA led him to this career in flavor manufacturing. On the show, you'll hear his origin story. We also talk about his podcast, how and why he started it, and some takeaways from the guests he's had on the show. Some of those guests include chefs Andrew McLeod, Philip Spear, Misty Norris, and today he's releasing an episode with pastry chef Francois Payard. Flavors Unknown is one of my favorite podcasts to listen to, so I really hope you go check it out. As always, you can find all the links in the show notes. And we'd love it if you supported the Chefs Without Restaurants podcast and community. There are a few ways to help. First, if you have a business or product, we're always looking for sponsors. You can also support our existing sponsors like Savory Jobs. If you shop on Amazon, we have our own affiliate link. Or be like cool kids Matt Collins and Justin Kana and consider joining our Patreon. If nothing else, it would be great if you subscribed to the show, rated it, and reviewed it. And maybe share your favorite episodes on social media. The links to all these things are in the show notes as usual. The support means everything to me. And now, here's a word from this week's sponsor, Savory Jobs. Did you know restaurants turn over employees four times faster than most businesses? What if somebody created an affordable and effective hiring solution for the restaurant industry? What if there were a job site that only focused on people looking for food service jobs? What if that site only cost $50 a year to advertise for every job your restaurant needed? Forget the big corporate sites like Indeed and Monster. Our sponsor, Savory Jobs, has a job site exclusively for restaurants. The best part is, Savory Jobs only charges $50 for an entire year, and you can post all the jobs you want. And for our loyal listeners, use the code SAVORY10 and get 10% off. That's S A V O R Y 10. So go to savoryjobs.com and discover the job site that's shaking up the industry. And remember to use SAVORY10 for 10% off. And now, on with the show. Thanks so much and have a great week. Hey, how's it going? Welcome to the show. Thanks so much for coming on. Thank you so much for having me, Chris. I really, um, you know, appreciate it. And I'm excited to be part of uh, your show. 
the tables are turned here. You had me yeah. on a few months ago, and That's now true. we get to put you in the hot seat and find out a little bit about you and the man behind the Flavors Unknown podcast. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, we'll see. I hope hopefully people are going to first uh, get used to the French accent and then uh, you know find something interesting in our conversation. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure they'll be fine. Well, I usually like to start kind of with like a backstory. So you're not a chef. What is it that you do in your day to day work? Sure. So I am in charge of marketing for a food ingredient company. So we manufacture flavors for the food and the beverage industry. So our customers will be, uh, you know, people like uh, Campbell's, will be, um, you know, people like Unilever, Nestle, um, you know, um, that's th that type of, um, of uh, companies. And um, what I do is, is really to uh, understand the end market. So that means the consumers trying to understand what are like the current trends, you know, in, in the market. What are the consumers, um, you know, desire um, at the moment? And uh, we are putting together some interesting new, new ideas and new concepts uh, that will leverage our technology, which is our flavors. And we are presenting this to, um, you know, to those food manufacturers and beverage manufacturers to say, hey, you know, this is what we have seen on the market. Here are some of the trends. You know, here's some of the, the technology that we have that are going to make you uh, create like a new. SKU for your brand or, you know, a new product. So that's, that's one of the exciting part of, um, you know, what I do, which is um, um, understanding food trends. And that's one of the reasons as well that I'm in contact with uh, chefs and, and pastry chef and mixology from around the country, because it's interesting because when I talk to them, they never uh, are excited when I always mention the word trend because they don't like that. Uh, they don't feel that they are creating the trends, but they do. You guys are creating trends. So, um, and food manufacturers are always interesting, interested sorry, to look at what the culinary scene in the U.S. Uh, is doing, because maybe one day this is going to trickle down, you know, via media into food service and then maybe later in retail product as well. So we try to help them to stay ahead of the curve and to, to innovate. How long have you been doing this? Mm -hmm. Should I answer the question? <laughs> <laughs> Way too long? No. Um, I, I'm, in fact, in that industry for more than 25 years now. Wow. So um, before in Europe, that's uh, the explanation of the accent. And then I've been in the U.S. for almost 20 years. So did you have to have a lot of food service experience going into like when you started did you know anything about the food world or was it just strictly a marketing job for you i think i went into it uh because i love food and i had some you know family uh, members i had an uncle that had uh, like uh, passed away unfortunately now but uh, had a, a a restaurant and a bar in france uh, he always let's say gave me the opportunity when i was going and visit him on vacation to uh bartend and you know to take care of guests and always that uh, always love that part of um, you know the, the business so food was always something that was like very interesting to me I just always wanted to have um, to create that like mean to to taste like new things and so on and then I started absolutely in my studies like completely outside of food I, I, uh, I had a master of organic chemistry so you can see it's a little far away from from uh, cooking and I did after that an MBA. And then to validate my MBA, I needed to have an internship. And my organic chemistry professor said, hey, you know what? I know a flavor company. And at that time it was in Grasse, France, south of France, southeast of France. And they said they are looking for an intern in marketing. And I discovered the world of flavors. At that time, I was probably 25 years old. And uh, I think I annoyed my friends and family during the summer because with all those little great you know flavors and hey look what we can do in terms of extraction like with citrus or vanilla and so on so let me put that in a cake let me put that in a, you know whatever recipe and I fell in love with um, you know with industry and I'm still in that industry you know since uh, since then because it's very creative and it's different every day. So how much are you guys reacting to trends and I guess how much are you creating the trend like are you guys kind of ahead of the curve or where, I guess like the short of it is like where are you getting inspiration 
as far as your company goes? Like, is it going sure. out in the field and talking to chefs and cooking? Mm -hmm. uh, are you exposing a lot of chefs to things they haven't seen? Like, how's that working? Yeah, so um, I, I think that's, uh, you know, nowadays the, the, the space is really uh, beyond, let's say, even the U.S. So we, I, work, I have the chance to work for a global company. So we are in 47 countries around the world. So I can talk to my colleagues in Asia, you know, I can talk to my colleagues in Latin America or in Europe. So that's one element of the source of inspiration, um, trying to see what's happening in, in Japan, for instance, or in Korea, or, um, you know, in Peru, and, uh, and say, hey, maybe there's some interesting concept and some ideas here that, uh, you know, some of um, the brand in, uh, in uh, food brands in the U.S. would be interested so that's one way for us to look at source of inspiration. The other one are, um, as I mentioned before, like the chefs and the pastry chefs and the, the mixologists in the country. So we do a lot of tasting. So I think I probably do, I would say, close to 80 tasting a year. Uh, and when I say tasting, it's not only one tasting. It's like, um, you know, several tasting in, in, in a city. Uh, so we, we, we travel. We have the chance to travel um, um, national wide nationally so uh, um, you know I, I have the chance to be um, either in Seattle or San Francisco or LA San Diego Austin Chicago Boston Miami and so on and uh, New York of course it's kind of the, the, the backyard here for me uh, in Brooklyn and so it's always being curious you know uh, to look at hey what's what's new oh that's a like a, a new location that's a new um a new restaurant or a new bar. So uh, let's see what's on the menu. And, oh, you know, that's an interesting combination that we never, never seen before. And then it's establishing like relationship with those culinary, um, you know, leaders around the country and, uh, you know, bring them into discussion and interviewing them. And even for my, you know, that the job, it's how it started before I created my own podcast. It was really, it started professionally. And, and that's a source of inspiration to, to see that, uh, hey, um, I don't know, maybe um, uh, yeah, you know, a certain chef in uh, Portland with um, Filipino you know, heritage have done something very unique. And um, that might be something interesting that we can leverage and we can bring in our own demos you know, for, for brands. So that's, that's how we, we work. That sounds like a lot of fun. Do you enjoy the travel piece? I mean, I've, yes, never, I do. I've never traveled for work and I know people who do and a lot of them say that's kind of exhausting and they don't have a lot of fun, but that sounds like a pretty fun job. I mean, it, I, I do. I do travel. Uh, you know, it's hard with, um, you know, uh, uh, private life and, you know, and professional life balance. But uh, I, I love meeting new people, interacting, asking questions, you know, trying to understand what was the inspiration behind what they have been you know, doing or putting a glass or, you know, on the plate. And um, yeah, so I love that. So I, I, I think this this month in, in September, I don't know when you will release the podcast, but, you know, September, uh, I think I'm, so I'm going to LA, Austin, Chicago, Philadelphia, and uh, Cleveland. So that's, that's only September. So, but you know, it's there's a part vacation and a part, you know, and the rest business. But during the those travel, then I have the chance to, um, you know, as much as I can, um, you know, taste something, uh, interact with a, a chef or a bartender, and uh, and see what's new. I haven't done it a lot, but it's always fun when uh, I've been a part of doing tastings before. Like we have McCormick in our backyard here, and a mm -hmm. couple of times I've been yeah. invited out to their corporate office to be part of a chef panel where there's, you know, maybe a dozen of us and they put a bunch of unlabeled things in front of us and have them try, you know, it might just be a spice yeah. blend and what do you like? And, uh, you know, the marketing department is kind of sitting there quietly off to the side and then observing, once, <laughs> observing, right. And once the chefs are done with us, they get to ask questions. Well, why did you like that? Well, you know, would you like it a little hotter? Would you like it more finely sure. ground? But they paid like $300 too, or something like that for me to go in and sit for a couple hours and taste some food. I was like, ah, oh, how do I get a job like this? Just doing it more often. But, you know, that's something that um, uh, is interesting when you just mentioned and that you are uh, the people that are listening to your podcast that are, uh, you know, chef without restaurants, you know, they should be aware of this because uh, there's company like the McCormick that you mentioned or company, like, you know, like ours uh, and uh, all this, um, you know, they always want to have 
inspiration and engage with um, you know with chefs and sometimes it's um, demos and uh, and I mean a part of I mean in the structure of the company there's as well what we call like a research chef so so there's people that maybe work in the industry and found like the you know the the hours and uh, uh, the work very exhausting and then you know they wanted maybe to to get like and have a family and have like different hours. And um, a research chef position, you know, are, are great for that. So we, we have research chef, you know, in our organizations, like a, a lot of other uh, food ingredient company, because they need chefs to create what they call like the culinary standard. Um, they have, they, they need to have the chefs to be uh, there to create like demos, you know, f- um, to present some of their technology, you know, to their customers. So something to, for your audience to think, you know, about if they want to do something different or explore something different. Let's jump over to the podcast. So you're the host of the Flavors Unknown podcast. Mm-hmm. So why start a podcast? Ah, good question. Uh, so, you know, just before I mentioned that I was doing chef interviews um, and I've conducted several like, um, and I still do uh, for my job, like panel discussions with culinary leaders from around the country. When I do those, um, it's really focused on, you know, my company and the type of product that we're doing and talking about flavors. And and I was always frustrated at the end of those conversations because I wanted to ask something different, things that I'm passionate about. And like, okay, that's not the space. I cannot do that. So uh, I said, oh, you know what? Maybe it would be great to, um, with all the network that I have, to, to create like a podcast. So talk to the president of the company and, um, you know, at the green light and uh, to make sure there was no conflict of interest, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and yeah. So when um, I started to have the idea in 17, um, started to um, put all my ducks in a row. Um, you know, I like to have everything really like ready uh, before jumping. And I launched it in September, 2018. But as this is, you know, that's not something that I live from. It's uh not connected to any business. So it's really more about passion. So I do it um, like every other week. I publish like, um, you know, a, a new episode every other week and not every week. So how many episodes have you done? Do you know offhand how many you have? Mm, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. Because like you do, I edit, you know, <laughs> myself. So I can tell you exactly. I just released on Tuesday. It's every other Tuesday. So number 78 uh, with uh, Chef Eric uh, Ramirez. And we talked about, um, you know, Peruvian influence in Peruvian cuisine. Very nice. Well, I love the show. You and I have had a lot of crossover with, with some of our guests. Um, yes. You you have a lot of restaurant chefs on your show. And sure. I kind of focus on not restaurant chefs, which is, you know, kind of keeps it interesting. So it's not all the same people on all the same shows. So what, like, what do you love about the podcast? I mean, you're having these great conversations, uh, just getting to know these chefs on a different level, finding their inspiration. Is that what really keeps you going? Yeah, I mean, um, what I wanted is two things. Is like, uh, um, I think because my my um, audience really is other chefs that are interested to hear what their peers are doing, and you know a little bit of, a little bit of what you you are doing. But you know, for chefs that are working in restaurants, as well for chefs that aren't working, you know, like uh, yours, not not in restaurants, but and then the other part are people like me that are you know like food enthusiasts or. You know, I don't like too much the word of the word of foodies, but and uh, the idea was to create this platform for them to share their passion, and so it's a really about understanding uh, their path to success. Um, it's really to you know talk about their challenges that they are facing, and you know we know at the moment there's tons of those, um, and yeah, it's about like their source of inspiration. Um, how they approach their creative process. Uh, so it's really the idea of, you know, okay, I understand your source of inspiration, but now what's the what's the next step, you know, when you're creating a dish or when you are like creating a cocktail, you know, what what's the, the second thing that you, you know, you are bringing, you know, is it about creativity? Is it about techniques? You know, that that type of things. And, and I have always a series of rapid fire questions trying to, um, talk to them about, ask them about, you know, what are like the great locations, uh, food uh, related or beverage related locations where they, where they live. 
um, and that type, you know, that type of things. So I have as well a lot of, of people that have um, that they are other uh, immigrants of first generation. So I'm always interested to understand how their cultural heritage, you know, influence their creative process. That's always something very fascinating to me. And has the tone changed at all over the past couple of years? I mean, we've had so much. I mean, obviously COVID and now everything with, you know, from restaurant closing, staff issues, PPP loans, you know, like I found when my show uh, hit like March, April, May of last year, mm-hmm. the same tone and topic kept coming up and not that it's not important, but it's like, uh, do people want to tune in every week and hear these like stories about how terrible things are? Like, what did you find with your guests as you're interviewing them? I mean, at the time, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, like the first month of the pandemic, there was always, you know, this idea of, okay, you know, I tried to select guests as well that were trying to do something different or uh, pivoted, you know, um, their business during the pandemic. Some people were doing pop-ups or were doing like, you know, fresh produce markets by by collaborating with local farmers and uh so trying to under you know to see like almost like a silver lining you know uh, something positive out of uh, of it and I know it's difficult to say that maybe it's easy for me because I'm not in industry and, and I'm sorry for chefs that are listening that says hey man yeah but you know for us it's really tough like every day I, I get that but I thought it was inspiring for the audience to to hear what you know uh, certain individuals you know have done during that time because it might inspire other. That. So that was the idea. Well, what do you have cooking right now? Do you have anything new on the horizon? Um, and I guess this kind of could be like, do you have any goals, either short term or long term? And that could be with your business or with the podcast. I mean, I, I think um, you know, with the podcast, is uh, there's always the same, you know, the same goal is to try to go to the audience and uh, um, and have more people, you know, listening to the to the show. Um, it's a lot about uh, word of mouth, um, as you know. Maybe the things that uh, I would done. I would have done differently. You know, launching a podcast is maybe spend time more upfront to think about like the promotion aspect and, and how to engage. You know, um, on, on social media. You and I know <laughs> exactly what uh, what it is about. Uh, um, and, and people that are not in that industry are not doing really any, um, let's say, uh, engagement in social media. It's maybe difficult to understand, but. Um, it takes a lot of time and a lot of our energy, uh, but um, that's something that I, I would have done differently from from the beginning if I would have known, you know, what I know today. But like in the future, um, I think I love some of the episodes that I am test. I have tested like different things, and I really like the panel discussions. So I think I will try to do more panel discussion in the future uh, because you know now remote technology allows us to um, to have you know several guests at once. So. Um, you know, I've done I've done one with three chefs in Austin that was really um, popular. I have done another one during the pandemic. You know, with uh, Noemi Pomeroy and Gabrielle Kreuther and Ian Bowden, uh, that was very popular as well. So, so I think I'm I'm trying I'm probably going to do more panel discussion. Editing those can be tough too. I did one yes. that I thought was going to be great. And uh, I don't know, someone was muting their mic on and off and they were, weren't talking. So the way it sunk the tracks wasn't right. So I had oh. all these tracks. I had one track where there was only like five minutes of talking and one where there was like 25 minutes and one where there was like 40. And I mm-hmm. like, had to scrap the episode because I couldn't figure out how to sync them all up. Oh, that's it's just tough. the way that Zoom worked with that. We had a really yeah. great discussion. But I'm like, uh, this was like a big waste of time because I can't release this at all because there was like no way to figure out where, oh, those, where those parts went. So. I don't know Zoom, so because I don't use Zoom, as you know, we we, we talked about it a bit before. Um, so I I can really separate each of the track and and treat it treat them like independently. And um, so far, I never had any like issue. You know, I've done one recently with uh, I don't know if you have seen this um, uh, documentary. It's on Hulu now. Called her name is Chef. Yes. Uh, mm-hmm. And so I had. Uh, the director, who is uh, Peter Ferriero, and I had Elizabeth Faulkner, one of the you know the person on the show as well as Juliet uh, Masters from Brooklyn, um, another chef, you know, a female chef on the show, and I had the three of them, and I think it's very dynamic. It's it's really interesting. So so yeah, so try to do more of those. Yeah, that's fun. I think maybe I'll have to put that on my to do list. <laughs> yeah, sure. Do you enjoy <laughs> cooking? Are you uh, someone who cooks in your free time? 
Absolutely. Are you any good? <laughs> yeah, you have to taste it once. <laughs> you have to taste my cooking. What do, you like, what do you like to make and what's your style? Do you have like a style or uh, kind of go-to cuisines? Um, I like to experiment. That's the things. So I probably have things that are grounded in my French heritage, I would say, and what I learned with my mom, you know, when I was a kid. So I, that's funny because to, today someone else like asked me that question. And uh, I said, I, I learned um, when I was six years old, I think to make like a quiche, Lorraine from scratch, including like the crust, because my mom was from uh, Lorraine region. So, so that's the first things I learned how to cook. And, uh, and so I started, you know, young to start to use this as a platform to, you know, create and be innovative by mixing different ingredients using the same base. Um, so, you know, bring some fish and bringing some vegetables and, uh, and so on, which my mom didn't thought that it was like not possible because she was from Lorraine and she said the quiche Lorraine, you know, has only to have like three simple ingredients. That's it. That's not a quiche. <laughs> so we had a lot of arguments when I was younger, but yeah, I, I always, when I, uh, we, I was a uh, young and no kids yet. And, uh, just me and my wife, we been like, like looking through cookbooks and uh, making like the lists of ingredients, uh, going to the farmer's market in France and, and, and cooking. I think that the first four years of our life together, we never cooked the same thing one, uh, twice. So that's impressive. Um, so that was, yeah. So that, that's really, food is really the passion, uh, you know, of mine. And um, so I do that. I mean, yesterday I had, a, I did a lot of, um, uh, I did two dishes um, around uh, Chantrail because I had a friend that uh, was um, able to uh, forage and um, he brought me um, a lot of Chantrail, which I love, mushrooms. And uh, so I, uh, that, I spent the time cooking, you know, because I, I had those ingredients. Having chef friends is always a good thing. Yeah, I mean, this one is not. I mean, it's the, uh, uh, he's the owner of the, the Brandy Library in, uh, in Manhattan. So uh, I had him on the, on the, as a guest on the, on the show as well. And um, so I was at the Brandy Library two nights ago. And, uh, and he said, hey, I have some chantrail. Do you want some? I'm like, man, absolutely. <laughs> Give that to me. So, uh, yeah. So I, 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 love, uh, I love cooking. And in all your travels, are there cities that you really love for, for dining out in? Yeah uh definitely i mean there's a lot that that's you know the things that i like is to tell my family and french friend when they always arguing that uh, you know in america people uh eat fast food i'm like just stop it you know i've been here 20 years and those individuals like those chefs around the country are, are phenomenal and uh, so i love austin i think austin has great scene you know, for food, I love Portland, Seattle. Um, there's great stuff. I mean, obviously you have like, you know, New York, Brooklyn and Chicago and LA, San Francisco. That's, you know, outstanding. Um, but that's, you know, Boston, it's cool. Miami, there's some great stuff as well. That's part of the way I travel. So that's been, um, you know, especially for vacation, I will spend days and, you know, my kids are really like, you know, make jo joke in front of me. Uh, because I I like to research. I like to spend time on Eater and Freelist and, you know, and Yelp and whatever. And then I, I reach out to my French friend, uh, uh, sorry, chef friends, and then and say, hey, what's what's interesting? So I map out on Google Map and uh, here it goes. I plan my vacations around where I want to eat. So I usually probably already know where I want to eat before I've even gotten to the city. Yeah. You and I are the same. But yeah, you go absolutely. to the you're, you're at your hotel and the concierge like hands you a map. Like, oh, here's the restaurants you sure. need to go to. It's like, <laughs> nah, I'm all set. Don't worry about that. Exactly. Who do you really think is underrated? I mean, you've had a lot of these great people on the show. Um, I always like to ask, like, are there any chefs who uh, you really love, but maybe aren't getting more mainstream attention who you think deserve it? I mean, I, I for instance, I, I, mean, I mean, he's he's known and so on, but compared to others, maybe as known as others, but there is, um, you know, uh, chef. Uh, and I think that you, you, you seen him like recently because you went to Asheville. Yeah. So like Andrew, Andrew yeah, Andrew, <laughs> yeah. Andrew for me is 
fantastic. Yeah, like he he knows so much, you know, things. So Andrew McLeod uh, from Avenue M in uh, Asheville. I was just talking about him on another one of my podcasts that I recorded a couple of days ago because I talked to Jeff Stoneberger, who Jeff's mm-hmm. worked with him a lot together. Yeah. Um, they've kind of traveled all over working at places. And that's how I got to know of Andrew. But yeah, like the food that he is making down there is amazing. And, uh, you know, I didn't even think about it when I was going to Asheville. Somehow I just forgot, right? And we got down there and I needed to eat somewhere. I was like, Oh my God, like Andrew's restaurants here. Like sure. I, I, it's been on my radar. I would have been so upset if I had gone home and forgot that his restaurant was there. Mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't know how that passed me over, but yeah, but guys like him, that's what I mean. You know, I think he doesn't, he's not really on everyone's radar. I think chefs know who he is. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah I mean, uh, there's another one that uh, comes to my mind. Um, I love my discussion. He He's almost like a food historian, which, uh, you know, we had like a, a great discussion together. It's Levin Wallace from uh, based in Nashville. And, you know, with the whole pandemic, he was supposed to take like, a, you know, before the pandemic, like a, a chef, exit chef position, and then that didn't happen. So he created his own business. Now it's called Fat Belly uh, Pretzels. In, uh, and, uh, you know, he started to make that at home um, and his kids, you know, loved it. And his wife said, why don't you bring it to the farmer's market? And boom, you know, it exploded. But that guy is, he has done, so much like so many different position you know in uh in being chefs in uh, a different setup and uh i love the discussion it's i think it's you know he's going probably to do some great stuff like in uh you know in the future i've never been down to nashville that's on my list and oh, actually, you should, I, yeah. I haven't been to austin either which has also been on my list of places so i have to get down to those two areas yeah i mean in austin i love um someone i it's i think a great human being is Fiori Tedesco from Locadoro in Austin. I love as well Michael Fodege from Olome, um, you know, in Austin. Um, so great, uh, great people. And I got like recently the pastry chef, uh, uh, Philip Spear from, um, uh, I don't remember. The Commodore? Question. Commodore, thank you. So uh, Commodore, so yeah. So, I mean, there's, there's a lot of uh, interesting, um, you know, individuals, someone that, started to get traction at Misty Norris from uh, Dallas, uh, which, you know, she's, she's a great, a great uh, chef. Lots of fermentation, lots of charcuterie, mm-hmm. lots of really oh, interesting yeah. stuff. Of snoot to tail. Yes, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> Love that stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is there anything you want to share with the audience before we get out of here today? I mean, easy. They should, um, they you know, they should try and listen, you know, flavors unknown and, and, uh, it's not going to take anything out of what you are doing, Chris, because uh, it's a it's a different approach. But um, you know, you are uh, the people that are listening to the podcast may f- uh, you know find interesting inspiration in uh, some of the people that I am that I'm interviewing, and then we have a different approach. So uh, it would be uh, a reputation anyhow if you had those people as uh, you know guests on your show. So no, I listen to the show. Everyone should listen to the show. It's it's one of my very favorite podcasts. I'm a subscriber. Thank you. And Appreciate it. You just have some amazing chefs on there. So yes, everyone listen to the Flavors Unknown podcast. Yeah. So thank you. I appreciate that. Thanks for listening to the Chefs Without Restaurants podcast. And if you're interested in being a guest on the show or sponsoring a show, please let us know. We can be reached at chefswithoutrestaurants at gmail.com. Thanks so much.